have audio on live stream. Uh, unlike last week, we are going to go ahead and get started uh, this evening. Abrahamim, Father of mercies, we worship you, Lord. We thank you for uh, this opportunity to gather together to dig into your word. Lord, I pray that as we dig further through Hosea, that you will speak into our hearts and our lives, that we will get a better grasp for what you are saying to uh, Israel through Hosea's prophecy uh, and the, the reality of the thread work of the concept of teshuvah, of repentance, of returning back to the Lord that we see sown throughout the entire book of Hosea. Lord, I pray that you will prepare our hearts as we dig into this, that we will have a uh, discussion that glorifies you uh, as we move through this evening. B'shem Yeshua Meshachinu. In the name of Yeshua, our Messiah, we pray. Amen. All right, so... Uh, as we say regularly uh, on Tuesday nights, if you are joining us online, <clears throat> particularly on Facebook Live, and you have any questions or comments as we make our way through uh, the study this evening, please feel free to post those comments or questions on the Facebook Live video. Uh, if you are watching in another way, such as on BoxCast or what have you, and have the Mein Chaim app, please feel free to post your questions or comments on there, and we will do our best to try to interact with them as we see them roll in. Uh, and then we have a microphone for those in-house uh, that may have questions so that those online are able to, uh, to, to hear and interact and respond uh, as well. Um, now, there is something that uh, we, we may consider doing in the, the near future. It'll probably be after this study, um, and that would be the potentiality of uh, adding a uh, uh, response or a, a dialogue option on our BoxCast video as well, which would allow for people watching on BoxCast to interact with us through uh, our Bible studies as well. Uh, but we'll keep you apprised as that progresses. So tonight we are picking up with Hosea 6. We actually sort of covered the first three verses last week. We're going to go ahead and dive back in, read the whole chapter in context, and start back with verse 1 uh, again this evening just to, uh, to keep on track and uh, to remember exactly where we are. So chapter Chapter 6, beginning with verse 1, reading the whole chapter in context, we'll come back through again and uh, discuss through it kind of verse by verse, section by section. Come, let us return to Adonai, for he has torn, but he will heal us. He has smitten, but he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up, and we will live in his presence. So let us know, let us strive to know Adonai. Like dawn, his going forth is certain. He will come to us like the rain, like the latter rain watering the earth. O Ephraim, what shall I do for you? O Judah, what will I do for you? For your loyalty is like a morning cloud, or like dew rising early and vanishing. Therefore, I cut them down by the prophets." I slew them by the words of my mouth. Now the judgments pronounced against you, light will go forth. For I delight in loyalty and not sacrifice, knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. But like Adam, they transgressed a covenant. There they dealt treacherously with me. Gilead is a city of evildoers, tracked with bloody footprints like marauding bands waiting for a man. So a company of priests murders on the way toward Shechem, for they have committed crime in the house of Israel. I have seen a horrible thing. Ephraim's prostitution is there. Israel has become unclean. Also, Judah, there is a harvest for you when I return my people from captivity. All right, so going back to verse 1 again, uh, verses 1 through 3, uh, one more time says, Come, let us return to Adonai, for he has torn, but he will heal us. He is smitten, but he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up, and we will live in his presence. So let us know, let us strive to know Adonai. Light, like dawn, his going forth is certain. He will come to us like the rain, like the latter rain watering the earth. So 
As we said last week, verses 1 through 3 of Hosea 6 are kind of uh, piggybacking on the close of chapter 5. Uh, more so, it really serves as a kind of a, um, uh, a leeway from chapter 5 uh, to chapter 6, verse 4 through uh, chapter 7. Chapter 6, verse 4 through chapter 7 uh, as a whole uh, kind of brings about a culmination, if you would, to these first few chapters of Hosea. Chapter 8, we begin to see the, the, the prophecy of Hosea shift gears just a little bit. So as we look at this, verse 1 says, come let us return to Adonai. The, the Hebrew word there, uh, the, the root word that we get return uh, is shuvah. Uh, we Typically, we say teshuvah, like to return, uh, but that, that root word is shuvah, and it literally means to return to the Lord. It is the foundation of the Jewish understanding of repentance. Um, you know, in, in the body of Messiah, we have this uh, terrible tendency that we think of repentance solely in the mindset of, of asking for forgiveness because we realize we messed up, but not actually Changing anything about the way we live or anything that we're doing. Um, and so we just continue a cycle over and over again of, of asking for forgiveness, particularly of stuff that we're doing again or we haven't stopped doing or whatever else. Um, whereas the, the actual biblical concept of repentance is this idea of teshuvah, to return. Um, and, and you've heard me, if you've been a part of anything at CMC before, you've probably heard me talk about this a lot. The idea of teshuvah is, uh, as a concept or a root for repentance, is to, to realize that the, the meaning of shuvah is you realize you're walking in the wrong direction. Uh, so, you know, if you were trying to get to the, the uh, uh, Ron HaKodesh, the, the Holy Ark uh, on our bima that holds the Torah scroll, if you were trying to go there, but you were walking towards the exit of the building, you're going the wrong way, right? And so the idea of Shuvah is that we realize we're going the wrong way, we stop dead in our tracks, we turn 180 degrees back around, and we walk towards the loving arms of the Father, or in the case of this example, we walk towards the Ark uh, the Torah arc, but the idea is we walk back towards the loving arms of our Heavenly Father in actual repentance, right? So repentance isn't, especially in terms of our relationship with the Lord, repentance isn't just haphazardly asking for forgiveness because we know we messed up, but not actually changing anything in our lives, right? What the Lord wants is that we repent and we change our lives to align with the covenant we have with the Lord. And this is what Hosea and these first three verses, this is what Hosea is calling out for Israel to do. He's calling out for the, the northern kingdom of Israel to return back to the Lord, to forsake the idolatry, to forsake all of the, the, the man-made issues, all of the problems, all of the sinful ways that they had fallen to and that they were going to be punished for in order to fully repent and return back to the Lord. And the idea here in these first few verses Verses, as we see with this next line is, if they repent, if they return back to Adonai, he who has torn, or the Lord who has torn, kind of nodding back to that idea of the lion before, he who has torn, he will heal us. He has smitten, but he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up, and we will live in his presence. Now that after two days, uh, it says after two days he will revive us. On the third day he will raise us up. As followers of Messiah, we can easily see the connection of these verses to the reality of Yeshua's death, burial, and resurrection, right? Obviously, Hosea, in writing these words, was not intending it for that purpose, but we can see the imagery there. And in fact, when Paul, in, I want to say it's 1 Corinthians, when Paul talks about uh, Yeshua arose on the third day, just as the scriptures foretold, this is the only place in the Bible in which anything is worded in such a way. And so what we see here is that he says, after two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up and we will live 
in his presence. What is the, what is the promise that the Lord has given uh, Ben Israel, the children of Israel, the people of Israel for, I mean, realistically since Abraham? What is the promise that was given through Isaac and through Jacob and, and at uh, the, uh, Mount Sinai when the, the Aseret Hadi wrote the Ten Words of the Ten Commandments was spoken to Israel and they saw the power and presence, the magnificent presence of God in the fire uh, uh, and smoke upon the mountain? What was it that God said he would do if we walk in faithful covenant with him? He would place his presence among us. He would walk among us. He would make us his people. He would be our God and his presence would be in our midst. That was the whole point to the tabernacle, right? Was for his presence to dwell in the midst of the people of Israel. So here he says, uh, on the third day, he will raise us up and we will live in his presence. How do we live in his presence? How do we get to that place to be able to live in his presence? Especially once we've sinned and we've walked contrary to our covenant relationship with the Lord. The only way is through teshuvah, through repentance. And as followers of Messiah, we recognize even more so still uh, it's not just through a haphazard spoken word asking for forgiveness, but it's through repentance in the blood of Messiah, asking the Lord to forgive us in the blood of Messiah to completely wash clean. Verse three, so let us know, let us strive to know Adonai. Uh, this brings to mind, at least for me, uh, Proverbs one, verse seven. Uh, Proverbs one, verse seven says, the fear of Adonai is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and discipline. The fear of Adonai is the beginning of knowledge. Right? He says, so uh, let us know, let us strive to know the Lord. Not just in the sense of like an egghead knowledge that there is a God. Not in just the sense of like there being a... Uh, um, uh, uh, not atheistic, what's the word I'm looking for? My mind just went blank. Agnostic, thank you. Not just in the sense of agnosticism where you kind of accept that there's something, some greater force out there, but you don't really know what and you don't have a relationship with it. Um, but in this case, it's very much literally, we will know the Lord. We will strive to know the Lord. How do we know the Lord? By walking in his ways. How do we know the Lord? By digging into his word and having a relationship with him, a covenant relationship. Danielle and I, uh, we've been married for almost 21 years now. Uh, and, and I can say, I know, Know Danielle, or I can actually strive to have a relationship with her in which I go out of my way to learn about her, to, to uh, converse with her, to help her grow and allow her to help me grow, and so on and so forth. And this is what this idea of covenant relationship with the Lord uh, really is all about when he says we are to know the Lord, to strive to know the Lord. And then we see Proverbs uh, says, the fear of Adonai is the beginning of knowledge, but fools Re, uh, despise wisdom and discipline, right? Israel is being told specifically by Hosea that you are going to be disciplined by the Lord. Why? Because you reject the fear, the knowledge of the Lord that is rooted in the fear of his power and presence, not in fear like trembling, right? We don't fear the Lord in the sense that we're afraid he's going to, you know, haul off and knock us against the wall, but we have a fear of the Lord. We have an admiration and an honor of who he is, uh, a, a healthy reverence for who he is. And it says the fear of Adonai is the beginning of knowledge, uh, but that uh, fools despise wisdom and discipline. Israel very much so has despised, this northern kingdom has despised the fear of the Lord, has despised or rejected knowledge of the Lord. And Hosea's cry is that we would return, that we would make teshuvah, uh, that we would return back to him, that we would repent of our sins so that we could know the Lord again in covenant relationship as we have been called. Like dawn, he goes forth. Uh, uh, like dawn, his going forth is certain. He will come to us like the rain, like the latter rain watering, watering the earth. Now, this imagery is important, right? Because Israel uh, uh, is more or less a pretty... Uh, difficult area to, to, to grow harvest in. It's a lot of desert. It's a lot of dry. It's a lot of hot. Um, but Israel gets a rainy season 
much like you would see in, in other uh, parts of the, the world, like in, in North Africa, uh, Central Africa, Southern Africa, etc., you have rainy seasons. And you have non-rainy seasons. And you may get a little rain every once in a while in the non-rainy seasons, but you know the rainy season is when you get your rain. And the rainy season is vital for harvest. Without the rainy season, you don't get the harvest at the end of the, 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 se- the, the season. Uh, when it comes time to, to harvest your grain or, or your barley or whatever else, without the rainy season, you don't get that because there's no water for the plants to consume and absorb. Uh, but what we see in Israel is you'll also have sometimes the early rains which come just before the rainy season so the rainy season is is usually like november to february and the early rains would come in like october late september october around the high holy days uh and then you would also sometimes have latter day rains and the latter rains come after the rainy season in like march or april and either way it went if there were early rains or there were latter rains it was a massive harvest awaiting uh, that the, it, it just amplified the harvest that could be uh, uh, taken in. And we see the same imagery with the latter day outpouring of the Ruach HaKodesh prophesied in Scripture. Um, and, and we see the idea of its connection to a great harvest that is awaiting the body of Messiah um, and, and so on. But here, what we see is this idea that, and, and when we go to Israel in February, uh, in February 2023, CMC and Britom are partnering, uh, and uh, myself and Rabbi Eric uh, from Britom are going to be leading a tour in Israel. If you haven't seen the information, jump over to shalomeasternshore.com forward slash Israel hyphen tour, uh, and you can look at the details, find out information, and and if interested in joining with us, you can go ahead and make your reservation and book your trip. Um, But when we go, we're going in February, and February is kind of the tail end of the rainy season. It's pretty common to catch rain in in that period of time, Um, and, and one of the reasons we selected to go in February wasn't just that February is one of the most inexpensive expensive times to go, but it was more so because it, I, I, we wanted people to see how valuable rain is in Israel. Here, we get rain. I mean, we've had rain almost every single day for, what, the last three weeks, I think, here on the Gulf Coast? Almost every single day for three. And I don't mean just like, you know, it sprinkles a little bit here and there. And I mean, we've had thunderstorms almost every single day. We had thunderstorms last night that wiped out the power and cable and stuff and, that, and neighborhoods around us and all that. Um, but in Israel, and, and so we get a lot of rain, uh, this area, Mobile, Daphne, uh, Mobile County, Baldwin County, uh, actually, generally speaking, has a higher annual rainfall percentage uh, than the Seattle area does. And Seattle is known for rain, but we get more rain uh, than even Seattle does. Um, and so when we think of rain, we're like, oh, great, rain, it's going to rain again, awesome. Periodically, we'll have a few weeks where we won't get any rain, and, uh, and it's nice and hot during the, the the summer here um, and most of the rest of the year also but it's nice and hot during the summer here and periodically we'll get you know two three four weeks where we won't get much rain at all and the ground gets really dry and uh and, and as soon as a rainstorm is coming everybody's excited because hey we're gonna get a little rain the land needed it and then it'll rain for a day or two and everybody starts complaining and i'm one of everybody everybody starts complaining because it's been raining uh and i hate when it's thunderstorms and and raining nonstop because it's less time i can spend on the bike it's not that i have any issue with the rain i just really like riding my motorcycle and i can't do that when lightning's dancing around me i mean i could it's just not recommended but um but in israel there isn't a point in the rainy season where Israelis are upset about the rain. They're excited about the rain. They're, they're, I mean, people will go out in the street and, and dance and sing and rejoice, and there's prayers that are said in Judaism thanking the Lord for the rain uh, that provides the, the, the life and nutrients for our, our harvest and so on. So this idea of uh, the rain, he says, he will come to us like rain, like latter rain watering the earth. In other words, he will revive us. If we return to him in repentance, he will revive us. He will will restore us and he will renew us just as the rains falling upon the crops uh, in Israel would experience. And it's a powerful image. I mean, we look at this, it's only three verses, right? And we just talked about a ton of stuff. And by we, I mean, I talked a lot, but we just talked about a ton of stuff and just three verses. Now think about the imagery of the whole book of Hosea, where, as I said, when I was praying earlier, that there's this, this uh, thread that's seeming the whole, pa- whole ch- uh, book of Hosea together, this thread of the idea of teshuvah, of returning, of repentance. As a matter of fact, Hosea 14, right out the gate, that's how it opens up. Return, O Israel, to the Lord your God, and he will forgive 
forgive you uh, or he will renew you. And so as we look at this, there's this threat of repentance. I talked about it at the end last week, uh, the end of Bible study last week. God tells us that when we sin, when we break covenant relationship with him, there are consequences that will come, right? I mean, we can read that in the blessings and curses of Deuteronomy 28 to 30. We can read that towards the end of Leviticus. We see these, what is it, Leviticus 26? We see these uh, blessings and curses and the, the idea that when we walk right with the Lord, there's blessing, and we walk contrary to the Lord, there's curses, or there's, uh, uh, you know, the, the being outside of his blessing, outside of his will in our life. Um, but when we return, when we return faithfully in repentance, it changes everything. And I think about the story, uh, the, the parable in the, the Besor and the good news in the Gospels of the, the uh, um, my mind just went blank on the word, the something son, prodigal th- son, thank you. Mine went completely blank on the word prodigal. Uh, if this had been something I'd prepared to talk about, I could have had it written down. But nonetheless, uh, the, the, I think about the prodigal son. And when you know, the prodigal son goes to his father and says, hey, uh, I want my inheritance now. I want to leave. I want my inheritance now. In ancient Near East culture, if you get, I mean, the same is true for the most part now. If you get your inheritance, what does that mean? It means that somebody died. Right? So if you get your inheritance from your father, that means your father died. So the son going to his father who's still alive and saying, hey, I want my inheritance now because I want to go party. Think about it. What's the son saying to his dad? As far as I'm concerned, you're as good as dead to me. Give me my money. I want to go. Right? And he leaves and he goes and he wastes it all away and he parties and he ends up sleeping with pigs and eating food out of the pigsty and all this kind of stuff. And, and all of a sudden he thinks about it and goes, if I were just a servant or a slave in my father's house, I'd have it better than this. Let me go back to my father's house. I'll just run back to my father's house, right? I'm going to shuva. I'm going to return back to my father's house. And when he gets there, and, and I love this part of the story, because if you read the parable, uh, I, I love this part of the story that when the father is looking up, he, he's outside, he's out front, he's looking up, and he sees the, the prodigal son, the son returning, coming down the street. Now, I want you to picture this, that it's likely that the father, sat on that, you know, imagine today with front porches, uh, but the, the father likely sat outside of his home every day hoping for the day that he would see his son come back. Just hoping for the day that that son would come back at some point. And as he's waiting, all of a sudden, one day, you know, months and months, maybe years go by, and he's out there, and he's just hoping, and he's praying, and he's longing for the day when his son comes back and is restored to him. And this one day, he just happens to look up, and there's his son coming down the, 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 the driveway. And he just takes off running. I mean, just absolutely doesn't miss a beat. Takes off running, runs, and wraps his arms in a loving embrace around his uh, uh, son's neck, and tells him how much he loves him. And, and he says, look, you know, I had this son says, I had such a terrible time. I did a terrible thing. I know that I'm nothing in this house anymore. If you would just let me be a servant or a slave in your house, I would have it so much better than what I left just a, a few minutes, a few days ago. And his father says, what? No, you're a son. Let me restore you. Right now, he's written off his uh, uh, access to his inheritance, but the Lord, uh, his father wants to restore him. And it's this image for us as believers the fact that we were created in the image and likeness of God and as we were created in the image and likeness of God when we have sinned and walked away from the Lord he's still there waiting for us to return to him and I know that a lot of times when we are walking in sinfulness we we have this mindset that God is distant from us and far away from us but the reality is is God has never left us we turned our back on him but he's never left us he's there waiting for us just to turn around and see that he's there He's there waiting for us. And so just like with the prodigal son, our heavenly father is sitting there waiting with his arms wide open. I think of the northern kingdom of Israel. And this is exactly what Hosea is trying to get through their thick skulls. Is if you simply turn around, if you simply make teshuvah, if you simply return and repent to the Lord and ask him to forgive you of your sins, he will revive you, he will restore you, he will renew you, and he will let you live in his presence again powerful reality, especially in the consideration of the fact that the northern kingdom, Rehoboam's very first action 
as the king of the northern kingdom of Israel was to establish a uh, alternate uh, altars and pagan worship sites and all of this along the borders of the northern kingdom so that the northern kingdom people would not make their way down, the tribes in the northern kingdom would not make their way down to the southern kingdom. He intentionally set up barriers between the people of Israel, the northern kingdom of Israel, and the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, intentionally set them up. And yet, despite this, the Lord is still saying, just come back to me, right? We believe 100% that it was the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, that inspired the authors of the Bible to write the words on the paper that we are reading, right? Without a doubt, we 100% believe that the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, inspired the words. So Hosea's words here in Hosea 1, uh, 6, 1 through 3, which is a cry for Israel's return and repentance, they aren't just his words, this is the heart of our heavenly father for his people in the northern kingdom of Israel is the heart of our heavenly father for his people in the southern kingdom of Judah. It is the heart of our heavenly father for all of his creation, Jew and Gentile alike, to return to him. So much so is this his heart that he gave his only begotten son, Yeshua HaMashiach, so that we could be forgiven, restored, and renewed because of the blood of Messiah. It's unreal to think about how uh, the, the words of Hosea and many other prophets continue to draw us to the promise and the reality fulfilled in Messiah Yeshua. And when we look at Hosea uh, and this idea of repentance and return, what we see is that uh, this thread of return of repentance isn't just sown through Hosea's books, uh, through Hosea, the book of Hosea, the prophecy of Hosea. It's sown through Isaiah. It's sown through Jeremiah, through Ezekiel. It's sown through uh, uh, Zechariah, through through uh, Obadiah, etc. It's weaved through it all. We see it in Jonah for the Ninevites. What's the cry of the, the heart of the Lord for the Ninevites? Return, repent, come back to me, right? These are uh, uh, people of the nations. The Ninevites were people of the nations that hated the Jewish people, that killed Jewish prophets. And here the Lord's heart is, return back to me, come back to me. That idea of repentance, of return, of teshuvah is a thread that is sown throughout the entirety of the word of God from Genesis to Revelation. And it's no different for us today as followers of Messiah Yeshua. His heart is still for us to return, not just to, to speak out of our mouths asking for forgiveness, but to return to a faithful covenant relationship with him. And I believe wholeheartedly that that includes living out the word of God from Genesis through Revelation. Not just Matthew through Revelation, not Acts through Revelation, but Genesis through Revelation, living that out by the leading of the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, and our hearts and our lives daily, returning back to him in true covenant relationship. Any questions or, or comments, thoughts on those first three verses before we move into verse four? All right, verse four. <clears throat> o Ephraim, what shall I do for you? O Judah, what will I do for you? For your loyalty is like a morning cloud or like dew rising early and vanishing. Therefore, I cut them down by the prophets. I slew them by the words of my mouth. Now the judgments pronounced against you, light will go forth. For I delight in loyalty and not sacrifice, knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. So let's go back real quick. Oh, Ephraim, what shall I do for you? This is the Lord's response, right? Verse 1 through 3 is Hosea's cry for Israel to repent, to return to the Lord. And verse 4 begins the Lord's response to Israel. Right? They haven't repented yet. They haven't heeded Hosea's cry. But this is the Lord's response. Oh, Ephraim, speaking of the northern kingdom, again, often in, uh, in the Tanakh, especially in Hosea, we'll see uh, kind of synonymously used Ephraim and Israel or the northern kingdom. Oh, Ephraim, what shall I do for you? Oh, Judah, what will I do for you? For your loyalty is like a morning cloud or like dew rising early and vanishing. How painful of a thought is that? The Lord is saying, hey, 
I've given you covenant relationship. I've given you my commandments. I've given you blessing. I've given you the promised land just as I have promised for you. I have established you and given you roots in the promised land just as I promised would happen. And yet you still continue to reject me and to revolt against me and to be rebellious against my word. You still continue to chase after the idols and and the people of the lands around you rather than being faithful to me. Israel was called to be what? to be a light to the nations. And instead, we continue to look to the nations to learn how to do what they're doing instead of following what God's called us to do. For your loyalty is like a morning cloud or like dew rising early and vanishing. In other words, yeah, you'll be faithful. You'll be loyal for a while. In my, uh, my, my own personal discipleship, my daily reading through the Bible right now, I'm reading through Hosea again, which is kind of funny that it's timing up with while we're doing the study. I'll be out of it long before we finish the study. Uh, but, but nonetheless, I'm reading through Hosea again. But I'm also right now reading through Judges. Uh, and, and I'm pretty close to wrapping out Judges and moving into uh, um, for Samuel. But what's interesting as we look through Judges is we see several times this phrase is used in the, the book of Judges that the people chased after their own hearts or after their own ways. In other words, they did what they thought was best and they weren't too concerned with what the Lord said we should do. And so as we look through the book of Judges, we see that over and over again. But the other thing we see, and we see it also with the lineage of the kings uh, post-Solomon, um, is what we see is that there's a period of time where Israel will, will sin egregiously and the Lord will bring down punishment. Uh, uh, they'll suffer at the hands of the Philistines or they'll suffer at the hands of uh, the uh, Ammonites or whoever else. And, and they begin to complain to the Lord, right? Because, you know, why not? Oh, I messed up, but it's your fault, God, right? How often do we do that in our lives? Uh, the Lord calls us to do something. We do something contrary and then we blame the Lord. How could you let this happen to me? How could you let, you said you love me. How could you let this happen to me? And so what we see in Judges is that Israel will sin. They will walk contrary to the Lord. Uh, this is before the split, obviously. We're just dealing with the Judges. We haven't gotten to the Kings yet. Um, but they, they'll sin. They'll walk contrary to the Lord. They'll complain. And then the Lord will come in as they're repenting and crying out for the Lord to, to relieve them of the trouble of the Philistines or whoever else. And the Lord will bring a fresh judge in and this judge will bring peace and bring victory over their enemies and they'll have peace under this judge for 40 years or 20 years or 30 years or whatever it is. And then as soon as that judge dies, right afterwards was the very next thing that Israel does. They go back to chasing after their own hearts rather than following with what God desires for them to do. And so in the same sense, that's exactly what we see here. The Lord says, uh, for your loyalty is like a morning cloud or like dew rising early and vanishing. You'll be loyal for a moment. Yeah, that's great. That's wonderful. You'll return back to me. You'll make teshuvah. You'll repent. You'll walk faithfully for a minute. And then as soon as you see grass on the other side that you think's greener, you're going to go chasing after that and forget all about me and write me off. Therefore, I cut them down by the prophets. And we see over and over again uh, that the Lord brings prophets into uh, the, to speak to the nation of Israel specifically for the purpose of warning them of the punishments that will be coming. But more so, again, that thread sown throughout the prophets of a call and a promise of restoration and renewal through repentance and teshuvah. So, yeah, you know, he says, I'm, I'm breaking them down by the prophets. I slew them by my words of my mouth, by the words of my mouth. Now, the judgment pronounced against you, light will go forth. In other words, the judgment pronounced against you is about to happen. As fast as light moves, it's about to come on you, and there's nothing you can do about it at this point. Now, there is. They very easily could have returned, but they refused to. They very easily could have repented, but they rejected instead. For I delight and loyalty and not sacrifice knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. Now, there's a couple of things about this. First and foremost, and, and most are familiar with this, right? Most are familiar with this, this concept. Um, there's a couple of things about this that are very important. Does God uh, not at all care about sacrifice and, uh, and, and about uh, burnt offerings? Well, no, we know God does because he told us to do that. He gave us mitzvot, commandments in the Torah, for these processes of sacrifice and offering. Now, what's really interesting is, why is it that the Lord says, uh, I delight in loyalty and not sacrifice knowledge of God more than burnt offerings? What was the purpose for the sacrifice and offerings? Why would we have to make sacrifices and offerings? Was it because that was specifically what God wanted us to do? No, they were often atonement for sin, right? Right? 
So the sacrifices and the offerings are a part of the restoration and the renewal. It's a part of the return uh, and seeking restoration and renewal. But it wasn't the Lord's heart. His heart would be for us to walk in covenant relationship faithfully with him, not to reject him, not to walk contrary to his ways. And if we do that, we don't need the sacrifices and offerings. Funny how that works. If we actually do what God says, we don't have all these terrible things happen that we've got to then turn around and repent from. But he says, uh, for I delight in loyalty. And the word here in the Hebrew is not, uh, it's a word, it's the word chesed, uh, which means uh, loving kindness or mercy. Uh, it's translated here as loyalty. Um, but the Lord says, I, what I desire is chesed for you to love one another, for you to be merciful and forgiving to one another, for you to uh, have loving kindness to one another, and you to be faithful to one another. How many of the commandments that meets vote throughout the Torah deal with our relationship with other people? Don't move, uh, you know, it's a sin to move the barrier, the property lines of your neighbor. It's a sin to uh, uh, lust after your neighbor's wife or his uh, servants or to uh, steal his cattle or to do whatever else. Over and over and over again, we see these commandments that deal with our relationship with those nearby and those uh, are our neighbors. And he says, I delight in your chesed and your loving kindness, your mercy, your loyalty, and not sacrifice your knowledge of God more than burnt offering. And again, uh, we talked about this before uh, just a few minutes ago, Proverbs 1, 7, right? Uh, the fear of Adonai is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and discipline. The Lord desires for us to want to know him. And how do you know somebody? It's through close relationship, through a covenant relationship. Um, you, you can't say you know that, or that you have friends that you know really well if you never talk to them, you never interact with them. And I'm not talking about those friends. You know, we all have those friends that, uh, you know, you maybe talk to or see once every 10 years, but for whatever reason, it feels like you never missed a day when you get together with them or you start talking with them. Um, and I'm not talking about that kind of a relationship. What I'm talking about is you can't call somebody a friend if you have no relationship with them. If you never talk to them, never interact with them, never do anything for them, kindness, love, and mercy, that's not really friendship, right? And so what the Lord is saying is, I want you to have a knowledge of me. And how does that knowledge come about? That knowledge comes about by us being in covenant relationship faithfully with the Lord day in and day out. We would call it today discipleship. It is by being faithful disciples to the Lord, spending time communing with him in prayer and in worship, spending time in his word, digging into it, trying to understand it, if necessary, digging into outside resources to get a better grasp of what other people thought of it, recognizing that outside resources, of course, is not the word of God, so don't get too excited thinking that the, the, the easiest way to know the Lord is to just read other people's things and not have to work for it yourself. Um, but the Spirit of God will speak into us as we're reading the Spirit of God's words upon the pages of the Bible. And so prayer and, and fasting and worship daily and, and being in the Word and being in communion in a holy convocation as we do here every week on Shabbat and, and so on and, and actually being a part of a community striving for relationship with the Lord. Our knowledge comes from a healthy reverence and fear of the Lord. Our knowledge of the Lord comes from our walk with him, not a walk contrary to him, not a walk opposite to what he's called us to be. Verse 7, but like Adam, they transgressed a covenant. They, there they dealt treacherously with me. Gilead is a city of evildoers tracked with bloody footprints. Like marauders, bands waiting for a man, so a company of priests murders on the way toward Shechem, for they have committed crime. Uh, so when we look at this, there's a couple of things, obviously, but like Adam, they transgressed the covenant. This is actually a, a dual reality here. Uh, it's a nod, obviously, back to Adam and Chava, to Adam and Eve. Uh, Adam uh, breaking his covenant relationship with the Lord by um, one, not stopping his wife from eating the fruit or rejecting the, the serpent trying to tempt her or rejecting eating it himself or repenting for his wife for having eaten it. You know, we, we give uh, Eve a bad rap a lot of times because people will say that Eve 
uh, that the first sin was Eve eating the fruit. I, I don't actually buy into that. Um, I think that was a sin she knew she wasn't supposed to when she ate it. So there's definitely personal responsibility that's necessary there. But I believe wholeheartedly it says that she ate and then she turned and handed it to her husband. Uh, Adam was standing right next to her when she ate the fruit. Adam was standing right next to her when the serpent uh, uh, tempted her. And Adam did not do what he was supposed to do as the husband in order to have the spiritual authority to protect and defend his wife spiritually. He should have uh, uh, rejected the serpent. He should have rejected the temptation of the enemy. He should have, at the very least, stopped his wife from eating the fruit, swatted it out of her hand, something. He should have, at the very least, rejected eating it himself, but instead he let all of that go, and he ate the fruit. I believe that the crux of the sin was upon Adam, not solely upon Eve, even though we like to put the bad rap on Eve. But as we look at this, it's not just dealing with Adam uh, breaking his covenant with the Lord, but these are actually all locations, cities, towns, villages that would have been through the northern kingdom of Israel. There was a, a village called, or a town called Adam, or Adam, and Gilead, and of course, Shechem. And so as we look at this, these are uh, different areas of the northern kingdom, Gilead being on uh, the other side of the Jordan. These are different areas of the northern kingdom of Israel, and so what uh, Hosea is saying, he's given us this image of Adam and Eve and breaking covenant with the Lord, but even more so, he's pointing out that this is not something that the, the, the breaking of covenant relationship with the Lord is not something that only one segment of the northern kingdom is guilty of, but that they're all guilty of it. And we can see it in Adam. We can see it in, in Gilead. We can see it in uh, Shechem that all of these terrible things are happening. Um, Gilead, they, uh, there they dealt treacherously with me. So that's what gives us the, the, the knowledge or the understanding that it's not just dealing with Adam and Chava, but specifically a town, a village, a city, whatever, called Adam or Adam. Uh, Gilead is a city of evildoers tracked with bloody footprints. We can go back to Judah. Judges, and we can see all of the, the, the ways that the Gileadites acted in the book of Judges, and a lot of it was not necessarily all that great um, in a lot of ways. And we can see that even since then, there would have been more that would have occurred, like marauding bands waiting for a man, so a company of priests murders uh, on the way towards him, for they have committed crime. Uh, and so it's a step down the line. So you've got commoners, you've got all these different people, and then you've got the priests guilty in the northern kingdom of committing sin as well. Um, and uh, when it says they committed murder, was it legitimate murder? I don't know. I wasn't there. I don't know how it is, but uh, I would venture to say that this likely has something to do with walking children through the fires of Molech and human sacrifice as much as it does anything else. And you got to remember that when Jeroboam, I'm sorry, when Rehoboam broke off and started uh, the northern kingdom, uh, one of the very first things that he did was establish these altars and these uh, 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 idolatrous temples and so on uh, for worshiping uh, against uh, or separate from Adonai rather than going down to Jerusalem. But he actually uh, uh, got the... the um, the, the priesthood itself involved in this process and, and got them connected into um, worshiping these idols and walking away from the Lord in the way that they did, um, which is pretty terrible if you think about it overall. Um, so when we look at this, we're seeing that very literally there were priests involved in the idolatrous worship. There were priests involved in all of these horrendous things that occurred, but the reality is that it was never God's desire or intention for the priesthood or the people of Israel uh, to, to act this way. And I actually had those names backwards. It was Jeroboam in the north, Rehoboam in the south. Rehoboam was the son of Solomon that became the king in, uh, in, Dru in Judah. Uh, and then Jeroboam was the one that revolted against him. I had it right the first time and I second guessed myself. Um, but uh, as we look at this, it's important to realize that um, these are realities of our own lives today. We are very much, as, as humanity, we look around the world, uh, humanity is falling rapidly down the drain. And I don't mean to take Hosea out of its context of the, uh, the, the northern kingdom of Israel and, uh, and being a warning to the southern kingdom of Judah uh, and, and try to force it into the 21st century. But we have to understand that 
as uh, um, Ecclesiastes says, is there's nothing new under the sun, right? Everything that Yeshua told us would happen before his return, everything that we read about in end-time prophecy uh, has happened before in different ways. And so when we're looking at Hosea, we can see this being the heart for the world around us. There were many years, many, many, many years in which Europe were, almost all of Europe was considered to be quote-unquote a Christian, uh, uh, quote-unquote Christian countries, right? Uh, North America, every part of North America was for the longest time considered Christian countries. The South America were Christian countries. Uh, and, and though there were other religions and idolatry and stuff that involved in all of them, uh, the reality is, is that it was long considered that these uh, various nations were all rooted in the Word of God, rooted in faithfulness to Messiah. Now, how uh, devoted the individuals as a whole were, or maybe the leadership of the kingdoms and nations and whatever, we can see some of the terrible things that occurred uh, through colonialism and so on and so forth. And we, you know, good people do bad things, bad people do bad things, and sometimes good people who think they're doing good things are really doing bad things. But the reality is, is when we look at Hosea, we can see that much of the accusations being thrust at the northern kingdom of Israel, the world around us is very much guilty of today. And I would venture to say that a significant portion of the body of Messiah is also guilty of it. And I'm not just talking, you know, obviously we as a Messianic Jewish synagogue, we uh, uh, do see value and, and importance and, and striving to honor the mitzvot, the commandments of Adonai found in the Torah as best we can within uh, uh, a context of Messianic Judaism and so on. Um, but I'm not talking solely about our observance of the commandments. What I'm talking about is that there are far too many people that call themselves believers today, that call themselves Christians or whatever else, that really are not living according to the Word of God, no matter how you define that. Uh, there, there are far too many people that call themselves believers but have very worldly mindsets about everything. Right? The northern kingdom started doing what? Chasing after the idolatry of the countries around them, of the peoples around them. And much of the body of Messiah today is guilty of the exact same thing. We see that with the integration of Eastern mysticism and New Age into uh, uh, the body of Messiah. We see that with the, 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 the voice of Chrislam or kind of an effort to combine Christianity and Islam. We see that with the uh, Unitarian Universalist kind of a mindset uh, that, that tries to filter its way into the body of Messiah. You know, the, the people that constantly say, ah, oh, you know, yeah, we believe that, that Yeshua, that Jesus is the Messiah, and we believe that this is our salvation, but every faith gets you to the same place ultimately, and it really doesn't matter what you believe. We all believe in the same God. We just have different ways of expressing it, different ways of, of interacting and relating with him, um, and, and this is just not the case. Either Yeshua is the way, the truth, and the life, and the only means for eternal life to be able to not only have the knowledge of the Lord uh, through our fear and admiration and reverence of him, but to be able to be in his presence as Hosea chapter 6 uh, calls us to do in repentance. The only way we can be in the presence of God for all eternity is through the blood of Messiah. There is no other way. I don't care how uncomfortable that makes us feel uh, as a Jewish believer. Uh, it is something that is very uncomfortable to try and wrestle with and deal with sometimes because that also means that we have friends and family that are Jewish that do not believe in Yeshua and does that mean that they're not going to be in heaven? Uh, these are very complicated conversations that we have sometimes, but the reality is, is it doesn't negate the word of God. Just because we're uncomfortable with the reality doesn't mean we get to alter the word of God to make us more comfortable with what's going on around us. And I believe that is what the universalist voice arising in the body of Messiah is trying to do is to make themselves comfortable with these realities that are uncomfortable about being a follower of Yeshua. There are those that will choose him and there are those that will not choose him. And that is our responsibility to live with whether we choose him or not. He goes on, uh, I have seen a horrible thing. Uh, I'm sorry, for they have committed crime in the house of Israel. I have seen a horrible thing. Ephraim's prostitution is there. Israel has become unclean. Again, Ephraim and Israel, the northern kingdom of Israel, are, are interchangeable a lot of times, are synonymous in a lot of ways. And so he's saying, uh, I, I've seen the house of, in the house of Israel, I have seen a horrible thing. What is the horrible thing? Ephraim's prostitution is there. Israel has become unclean. What is Ephraim prostituting himself after? And what 
what is it that has made Israel unclean? It is idolatry. It is the blending of and the mixing of pagan rituals and worship practices of the nations around them with the, 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 the practices and the commandments and the lifestyle of the Bible. It doesn't work that way. It is the rejection of the word of God in order to live out uh, in the midst of the pagan rituals of the, the nations around them. It is rejecting going down to the temple in Jerusalem in order to worship uh, idols and so on scattered about in the, the nation of Israel. It is walking our children through the fires of Molech. It is uh, uh, bowing down to the Baalim and uh, and, and making offerings and such of the asteropoles. It is the, the horrible, horrible ways in which the nations around Israel worshiped their gods that has now become a part of Israel, the northern kingdom of Israel's uh, daily interaction in their life, having rejected the ways of the Lord in order to walk in the ways of the nations around them, rejecting their call to be a light to the nations. And then verse 11, also Judah, there is a harvest for you when I return my people from captivity. And this is most believe a warning again to the nation of Judah, the southern kingdom of Judah, that there very likely could be very similar circumstances that will occur to the southern kingdom due to their uh, walking uh, contrary to the Lord as well, which we see through uh, First and Second Kings uh, and through Samuel, Second Samuel, we'll see over and over again the uh, the reality of there being a king that leads Israel in righteousness and faithfulness, and then all of a sudden there's a series of kings that goes the other way, and Israel begins to get uh, attacked by outside nations, and then another one arises because they cried out to the Lord in repentance, and He brings a, a savior, if you would, uh, and they bring them out into peace, and then they live a wholesome and healthy life for a little while, walking with the Lord, and then that king dies and they fall back in the same cycle again. Um, and so Judah is facing some of the same consequences. Again, the northern kingdom was hauled off by the Assyrians, attacked and overthrown, overrun by the Assyrians. The southern kingdom, years later, will go through the exact same circumstance, but instead with the Babylonians. And it will be even worse because with the Babylonians, not only does the southern kingdom, the kingdom of Judah, get disbanded from the land of Israel and sent out into the nations, but the temple is destroyed in Jerusalem is destroyed and raised completely uh, all because of our sins against the Lord and our refusing to walk in his ways and choosing to walk contrary to his commandments. We are not going to have time to move into chapter 7 this evening. So if uh, I want to leave these last little last few minutes for questions, comments uh, that may be uh, either in-house or online. If you're joining us on Facebook Live and you have any questions or comments, please feel free to post those. Uh, at this point, we're going to leave our live stream up for just a little longer so that uh, if there are questions or comments, we can try to get those in and interact with them. Anything in-house? So would you say it's an oversimplification to say that basically the point of the whole Bible is Teshuvah? No. I mean, everything post the fall, that is. Because pre the fall, there wasn't anything to shuv from. <laughs> but yes, yeah, I mean, that's the, the overarching narrative of the, the Word of God is to return. Um, you know, that's the repent, repentance is a cry of the Brich Hadashah, the New Covenant, the New Testament writings, uh, just as much so as it is in the Tanakh or the Old Testament writings. So reading through, it, it seems very interesting that Hosea specifically mentions Gilead and Shechem. Mm -hmm. um, just because you have the, the kind of where Abraham, it's reiterated to him that this is, this is, I'm giving you this land. Mm -hmm. And then you've got Gilead where you have, it's like, he says, I'm going to fulfill the covenant. Everything builds up to this moment. And then you get to Gilead and you have all these people who are like, eh, we don't want yeah. to fulfill the covenant. We're just going to stay over here. <laughs> and don't leave out, you know, Shechem appears multiple times in the journey of the people of Israel, right? So uh, Jacob's uh, daughter Dinah is uh, um, raped by Shechem, the, the, the person in which the town is named after, is, is raped by him. And so uh, when the brothers 
find this out. Simeon and Levi, the second and third born of Israel, uh, go and they tell the Shechem wanted to marry Dinah. Now that he's already taken advantage of her, he loved her, had a you know a thing in his heart for her, wanted to marry her, and so they go and tell them if if all of the men of Shechem will go and get circumcised, uh, then we will come and, and allow you to marry our daughters, and we'll be willing to take your daughters in marriage, and we can become one people. And so they go and they circumcise themselves. Right, a lot different than we do it today. Uh, they go and circumcise themselves. Themselves, uh, because they are in essence being faithful when uh, especially in uh, uh, the development of ancient Israel um, circumcision was conversion right so they in essence were choosing although the the motives weren't the best and and although what led up to the motives weren't the best they were choosing to align themselves with the God of Abraham Isaac and Jacob uh, and then what is it that immediately that uh, Simeon and Levi do, right? They concocted this whole plan. They go in when these dudes can't run, they definitely can't fight, and they can't do much else because they're in the heat of the pain of the reality of what they just put themselves through. They come in and they slaughter them all. Levi is whom the, the priesthood, the Kohanim, uh, and the, the Levitical priests come from. And so as we look at the, the city of Shechem, not only is there murder that occurred and, and ter terrible acts of uh, idol worship and such that occurred in Shechem during the northern kingdom, but we go all the way back to the, the narrative of Jacob and his sons, the 12 sons of Israel, and we see very literally murder occur in Shechem at the hands of the priests priests or the people that would become the priests, the Levi, uh, or Levi himself, um, which is absolutely mind-blowing to watch how this all just kind of cycles back around. Gary, yes, uh, Gary says on uh, Facebook, you may have just hit the nail on the head. We can only know the Lord if we dig into his word. Uh, agreed 100%. We just had this conversation at Torah on Tap on Sunday um, that uh, uh, we can't actually know the voice of the Lord if we aren't actually in his word on a regular basis, on a daily basis. Uh, I know so many people that will say, well, I just feel like I don't hear the voice of the Lord anymore. Well, are you in his word? Well, no. Well, how do you know if you're hearing it or not? You don't know what you're supposed to be listening for. You're not recognizing it. The Lord's already spoken to you in his word, and he will speak to you in inclinations and in his audible voice and whatever else. But first, you gotta be in his word. Because if you're not in his word, you're not gonna recognize his voice when he does speak. Um, so yes, absolutely. The way to know the Lord is to dig into his word. How do we develop our fear and reverence of the Lord? By being in his word. And what is Fear. It is the beginning of knowledge. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, right? Any other questions, comments? Just when I looked in the notes in my Bible, it, it says, uh, verse 6, um, For what I desire is mercy, not sacrifices, knowledge of God, more than burnt offerings. Yeshua also says this, mm -hmm. and I looked at those two verses, um, Matthew 9, 13, and 12, 7. And it's really interesting because Yeshua seems to be saying, like, you guys are not getting it. You yep. don't understand. Yep, and when you look at Mark 12, 33 is another place that uh, kind of references this. He says, and to love him, uh, here, I'll go back um, to 32. Well said, teacher, this is after the, what's the greatest commandment. Well said, teacher, the Torah scholar said to him, you have spoken the truth that he is Echa, that he is one, and besides him, there is no other. And to love him with all the heart, with all the understanding, with all the strength, and to love the neighbor as oneself is much more than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. Um, so we see that the, the Torah scholar responding to the Yeshua, you, that, hey, what's the most important commandment? Love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. Oh, yep, that's right. <laughs> you hit it on the nail. And those are more important than all offerings and sacrifices. And why are the burnt offerings and sacrifices necessary in the first place? Because of sin. But if we love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our strength, and love our neighbor as ourselves, what are we incapable of, sin of doing? Sinning, right? And so if we live in a mindset of chesed, of loving kindness, of mercy, of loyalty, then we don't have to worry about the need for sacrifice and for burnt offerings. But truthfully and wholeheartedly, the only way we can actually live in that place 
is if we are bought by the blood of the Lamb and fully enveloped and filled with the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. Right, Matthew 5, Yeshua says, you've heard it said, sin to commit murder, and I, uh, and, uh, I say, if you've been to somebody in your heart, you've already committed that sin. I'm paraphrasing, by the way. Uh, you've heard it's a sin to commit adultery, but I tell you, even lust in your heart, you've already committed that sin. All four of those issues are dealt with in the Torah. They're nothing new at all. None of them are new. He's not giving a new commandment. What he is saying is, for every external, there's an internal. And if you let the Ruach HaKodesh, the Spirit of God, the presence of Yeshua in your life, handle the inside so that you don't give in to the internal, you don't give in to the temptation, then guess what doesn't happen? The external doesn't sin, right? So when we are sinning on the external, it's because something's not right on the inside. And when that's the case, what do we need to do? Number one, make teshuvah. Number two, Dig into the word of the Lord, dig into discipleship, dig into hearing the voice of God, and begin to walk in faithfulness and chesed again, loving the Lord our God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our strength, not just part of it, and loving our neighbors as ourselves. And upon this, do these two is the entire Torah and the prophets hanging. Anything else before we... Uh, Kill the live stream. Any more questions, comments online, in house? All right, if not, we will go ahead and end our Bible study this evening. Next Tuesday, we will begin with Hosea chapter 7. Um, for those who are a part of CMC, if you are available Sunday morning uh, at 9 a.m., we're going to meet at the storage unit again down the street here. Uh, Toby and Brooke will be closing on their house on Friday, and on Sunday we're trying to get as many people as we can together to help move everything out of storage and into their new house. The more hands, the merrier, and the lighter work there is, and the less I hurt afterwards. So uh, please, uh, if you're able to, come and help us uh, with that event. Thank you.